Well, what do we have here? Yeah, another Trek 5200 in for a tune-up. Yeah, this is a um, pretty cool little bike. It uh, has an Altegra 10-speed componentry on it, and it had a lot of use, and we're just gonna, I don't know, give it its full tune-up. This guy is uh, selected to do the more, the guy's magic tune-up, which pretty much most bike shops have their level tune-ups, and we'll review that here in a moment, but Hey, just want to just do a shout out to, hey, I love my customers and they bring me cool stuff to work on. So without further ado, let's just dive into this. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles, hanging out with a guy. Hi, I'm Justin the Guy. Obviously I have a garage shop. Take scary how to use one bike at a time. If you want to be kept up to date on latest projects and topics, please like and subscribe. Hey, welcome back to a Noah Guy Bicycles hanging with a guy. Hey, I'm Justin the Guy on this whole bike series. And today we have a special Trek 5200 OCLV Autumn Compact Low Void. Yeah, it's fancy buzzwords for fancy carbon. Yeah, back in the day, these were made in the United States and Waterloo, Wisconsin, and they were lugged and pieced together. This one is actually fully painted, so you're not gonna actually see the lugs on the ones I've worked on before. Check out one of my other videos here with the 5200 I did with the detailing. You'll actually see the carbon weave through the clear coat, very pretty. But this is their traditional kind of steel, blue steel kind of uh, glitter. It is pretty in the sun as well, but we just need to really gotta clean up all of this um, scratches as much as we can and give it a good polish and yes you know what i'm gonna put a ceramic coating on this bad boy this tune-up is the more premium tune-up package that i provide I just to let you know there's several different tune-ups at every bike shop you go to there's kind of the entry mid and higher end and quite honestly what they try to do is always bump you up to the next level being a service manager i'm no longer a service manager i'm a shop owner so I'm just happy to see you to pick whatever tune-up that you choose. Um, so this particular customer wanted to have the drivetrain clean, the cables and the housing replaced. He brought him some nice uh, bar tape for me to install for him. And he also selected to go with a chain, a new chain that has stretched, but he wanted a new chain that actually has the pre-waxed. Um, this one has the super secret hot, hot milk wax already pre-treated on it. Well, if you haven't heard about wax, you've been left in the dark. Uh, wax is the old new thing, new thing old on chains. And I do have a video of several of them on how to wax chains and so forth. But a quick little synapse is it's smoother, it's quieter, and it actually keeps your drive chain from wearing out a lot slower and also increases your wattage. So all these little tests and done have been not just by me, but uh, more reputable people. And they've actually concluded that wax is the, the new new thing, even though back in Tour de France in the early 1900s, they put drip wax from their candles. You guessed it. Another nice feature of it is it's not dirty. So you're not gonna get this black stuff like this on you. It's super clean. Anyway, off my soapbox about wax chains. We'll go into that a little more detail when we put it on the actual bike. But this particular tune-up does have that detail package, which basically I strip the bike down to the frame. I do several layers of detailing from scratch and swirl from Adams. Also a compound kind of you know, correct the paint surface, the clear coat, and then a nice polish. And once that is all done, I top it off with a beautiful layer of a couple ceramic coatings to uh, stack it to give it the added protection water shedding properties as well it makes it look really nice too so what the heck um, also it's really really super smooth so it's like phew, slick as a whistle um, ceramic coatings you could be used on paint which is really kind of known within the automotive industry is where i kind of fell into it but in any case um, it also could be used on like rubber and plastic parts trim on your car, that kind of thing, which actually protects as well for the UV, uh, which is also another important factor. So that's kind of an added bonus to this tune-up. Not all bike shops will have this as a service. So um, lucky for this guy, I do. And it's something I've gotten into since I've been in the industry for over 30 years. Ooh, that makes me old. Any case, 
that's just one of those things. I'm always looking for new, you know, improvement to, you know, get add more value for the customer. A shiny, pretty bike, a detailed bike is also really nice on top of being a high function and safe ride. So any case, that's what we're talking about there. But back to the rider, he's a local cat that actually has some um, space up in Wyoming. So he splits his time, does a lot of riding down here in the Loveland Fort Collins area where we have a lot of beautiful bike paths and roads. So it's, we're very lucky here. And this gentleman has done a lot of rides on this, um, a lot of big feature rides like uh, double bypass, like Ride to Rockies, those kinds of events, the big ones. He has several of them lined up that he wants to get back into it. He has another bike that's more of their gravel bike, which a lot of, a lot of us have. But for him, he wants to get this one polished up and ready to go, do some training and get some of those bigger rides checked off of the list of things to do. He's about ready to retire. So kudos for him. Um, great things. Also, what's really cool is um, this came with a pair of uh, carbon wheels, not OEM. It didn't come from the manufacturer. He upgraded to these, um, oh, what brand is this? <sighs> Head or something of that nature, carbon, but something happened to the front. It became a boo-boo, so he bought a uh, Bontrager front to match at least the carbon portion of it. Yes, I will be cleaning those and put a ceramic coating on top of that just to give it extra shedding of uh, water droplets and UV protection as well. They, they do have a coating of carbon. Most carbons will not be completely raw. Reason being is they have to have a little bit of protection. It is a, a porous material, so they have to have to put a layer on top of that. So that being said, when you add a ceramic coating on top of that, and if there is any kind of scratches or any wear points that gets through to the carbon, it's actually gonna give you a little bit layer of protection, not like a clear coat by any means, but enough to at least protect it from penetrating the carbon. So a good little side note there. Um, they also upgraded to the rotor rings, which are pretty cool. I mean, they're just solid rings, less flex. You know, they have all these weird, crazy things to it, um, which is kind of cool. I don't know if I buy into the Kool-Aid too much, but hey, you know, it's there. We're going to look at it and give it a good cleaning. Um, why not? It does have the Altegra front and rear derailleur cassette. Uh, we'll have to do some really good cleaning on it too to make sure that new wax chain is not going to be pretty cross contaminated. So that's another thing too is you really want to clean your drivetrain uh, prior to adding a wax chain to your system is the wax. Well, I mean, it gets over on the component tree a little bit, but also prevents any kind of, or slows down the wear and tear of those parts and you want to have them as clean as possible. So that being said, these were also made in the United States, Waterloo, Wisconsin, nice little bike. Um, yeah, so yeah, let's dive into this. It has the Altegra where they upgraded into the 10 speed system. The other 5200 I just did recently had a nine speed system, so that was a crossover, but the frame is pretty much identical. And it also has this little sticker that's six time winner Tour de France. You know who it is. Oh yeah, Lance Armstrong himself. So they got the title stripped. I don't think you're gonna cover the sticker because of that, but in any case, that particular cat, yeah, there's a lot of pros and cons and yes, no's, hates, whatever, but you cannot unquantify what he did to the cycling experience in the late 90s. I remember my dad running into the shop because we were a truck dealer. Front page news of Lance Armstrong wins Tour de France, the first American on American team to win that. Well, what that did is really just insurged the cycling community to get really excited about, you guessed it, road bikes. And coming off of the hills of the mountain bike craze, it was kind of nice to have that second bike that people were looking to get into. I mean, we carried them the whole time, but they just collected dust until, yeah, Mr. Armstrong himself kind of one hand, one, <laughs> I don't know how I gotta say it. But anyway, he did his job. He actually added to the community um, from what happened after that. <laughs> Everybody loves hate or whatever otherwise, but you can't look besides that. Um, yeah, let's. Try not to go there. Um, anyway, the, this is where also the Bontrager parts was starting to be integrated into the line. We're in Bontrager now. Oh, Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz. Uh, California, where he started, uh, Bontrager was a parts 
uh, name designer, a big affiliate of Trek, part of Trek, and they just currently drop them. Um, not necessarily drop, he retired, and the line, the Bond Tracker name has been dropped off of the actual product mix, so that's just being converted over to Trek on most of the stuff. But that's where you're going to see those vintage pieces, like I me mean, from 10 years from now, you're going to be watching me a video like, oh, I remember reading a Bond Tracker back in the day in a parts small. Yeah, now, here we go. Uh, everything changes, and you know it, everything does. Um, just wait long enough, right? He does, man, he must drink a lot of water, but he's got two cages here and a three-pack in a back. Um, he must probably maybe carry one or two in his jersey, too, so six-pack for him. Uh, good to keep hydrated because Colorado is very arid. And uh, you may not know it, but you are sweating and evaporates faster, so you never feel wet here most of the time when you're riding, unless you get caught in a rainstorm. And here, a rainstorm, you basically duck and run and hide because our rainstorms are very aggressive. They have tornadoes, hail, and hard rain, and it's cold. Uh, my experience of warm rain was in Michigan, which was nuts. I know this is a side note, but warm rain, like, it was 70s and it was raining, and it felt good. It was weird. I never had that, because every time I rode in the rain here, it was kind of like frigid, and you just get hypothermia, like almost instantly. And you're watching out for lightning and hail all at the same time. Anyway, um, must get a lot of water, so that's good. You know, a little weather, weather trivia of Colorado arid climate, that kind of thing. So it does have a nice little computer here. Um, also, he has... Uh, and this bag in the corner is um, some, it's not a specialized roll, roll off wheels or roll, roll over all wheels. Blah, blah, blah. Um, they're actually the Trek version of the regular hoops that he has on this for training. So I'm going to be working on both and cleaning both cassettes and that kind of deal. But in any case, we should just probably dive into this. Um, yeah, I'm going to be shedding majority of the stuff off to get to the frame to clean it. And as well, use an ultrasonic cleaner here to clean the parts. And once the parts are cooking and going through its process, I'll clean, uh, clean and true the wheels and detail the frame. And once everything is kind of all laid out, then we do the reassembly process. And through all that, you know, as good as I am, and as long as I've been doing this, looking at a bike on the stand, doing a pre-check-in, there's always something that's probably going to be a, a gotcha. And, you know, uh, we try to do our best in the cycling industry, but you never know. Sometimes there's little hidden scaries that you just kind of take, have to roll with the punches. And, well, and, um, and unfortunately, fortunately in this one, I think it's in pretty good shape. Just a little bit of scarring from transportation and so forth. It doesn't look like it's been crashed. And for a heads up, if it crashes, you'll see scarring on the shifters and the rear derailleur, because those are the hanging out points where if you're gonna biff it, that's what it's gonna hit. Also the saddle, you'll see scuffing. So if you're looking for a used bike for yourself to buy and you see a lot of scarring in those points, it's probably been grounded a couple times and not in a good way. Um, so, hey, let's, uh, ooh, that's, oh, that's kind of cool. Better match the color cable tips. So, you know, that's usually a little professionalism for bike manic mechanics out there to match the decaling. So, hey, kudos to the former mechanic that worked on this. But now I'm going to criticize your work. <laughs> All right, we need to now strip this baby and not in the way you're thinking. Uh, we're <laughs> going to take the wheels off first, doing the quick release. Um, on these carbon wheels, you want to be careful. They're kind of, they have a, flex to them as to touch. Also a side note on carbon wheels, you do not want to hang them in the garage by hooks because there's not a lot of um, material here. Uh, this particular uh, carbon on the back rim is a little bit more reinforced. This one's a lightweight carbon sleeve over a uh, basically a standard aluminum rim. It's more for aerodynamics. Um, I don't think it really reduces the weight of the wheel. It's more of that aerodynamics. And also, you'll notice there's a little hole here. Well, this is deliberate from the manufacturer to drip, to drain. Um, I had a pair of these on a customer's bike before where they didn't have the drip holes. Uh, so when I went to wash it, it shedded water for the longest time. <laughs> In any case, um, we're gonna take care of this. 
he uh, opts to not get new tires just yet. Uh, he wants to wear these out a little bit more, so I'm going to clean them up. I'll need to put a new tube in the back on that one there, but uh, no worries. You know, it's one of those things. If you know, you know, and you know what you're getting yourself into if you have a worn out tire. Um, and then a lot of people, for the most part, will have a preference of a certain tire that they like. And uh, as if you've been riding a lot. If not, you know, these are the zips. Um, which is pretty pretty fancy Schwenk tire, uh, really good grip to them so forth. But then again, it's like your NASCAR tires in a way, in a weird way. Um, the higher performance it is, the softer the material, right? The better contact, but shorter life is the wear out fast. So eh, needless to say, you want to drop out and you drop in a drive chain train down to your small cog so it pulls that derailleur out of the way. I released the brake already, and then you guide your rear wheel right out. So on this guy, we're gonna pull this and check the hubs, how they feel. And this is kind of cool. Has a little uh, carbon cover, dust cover there. Don't lose any parts yet. Oh boy. Um, yeah, so we'll be taking care of that. No, we're not getting weird and personal. We're just getting down to the cassette. Ah, slip a toy, a true tool. Here we go. We got our cassette here, lock ring tool, chain whip. We use the ground as leverage uh, because you've got to break that free. And this guy is the Durace, I believe, titanium cassette. So we're going to pull this off and give you a little look. See, I mean, it just looks like it has like your dirt, standard dirt and grime. But whoa, look and lo and behold, a nice red free hub body. These are kind of cool to look at. Um, unfortunately, they get covered up because of the cassette. Um, that's the spacer. See on the inside of the cassette, they have a spacer to bump it out. On that, some hubs you don't need that spacer. But I um, wanted to point out here: this is an alloy free hub body. And looking at alloy free hub body, if it's a steel on the alloy free hub body, um, it will start scarring, cutting into these positions here. So a lot of mechanics will need to take a little flat file and kind of file those down. So it makes it easier for the cassette. As you can see, the spacer doesn't want to come off very easily. And uh, I'm going to file those down to clean them up so it goes on and off. And uh, hopefully, I'm going to put some lube on this too, some grease to kind of prevent it from doing that. But um, it's not really anything you can do. It just shows you where these uh, cogs are independent, right? And you, know, you can tell which ones you put in the most torque on is on the lower half. So not to say there's nothing you can do about it in the sense you can't tell the customer like, stop riding those gears. No, well, it's just a strong rider. So it's just gonna cut and all. So looks like the third to fifth cog up is where he's had the most, um, most riding. So in any case, just a little note on that. And yes, it's a carbon little cover there. These will be a, a sealed cartridge system. So we just wanna make sure they're not loose, not knocking back and forth, and it feels smooth still. Um, standard spoke nipples on these, so it should be fairly easy and straightforward to true. And again, his tire is getting a little more bald, but he wants to get a couple more hundred miles out of it before he switches them out. And uh, yeah, this has a little more of a, a thicker sidewall of the carbon, and also has the rim here. So it is your basic, you know, your rim here um, that are bonded, glued to the carbon itself. All right, so he has a quick link, so I don't need to use a chain tool. I use the pliers from Park, but there's other brands out there that do the job just as nicely. And you can take the chain off. I will be saving the chain to measure it to the new chain, just for only that reason. But other than that, this is pretty much toast. I like to take the pedals off. Um, I like to take the pedals off so I can make it easier to clean the crank set. So this one does down bolt on the inside. So you gotta work on those. And that makes it a little bit easier to take the crank off too, so I don't have to worry about ah whoo that as much. And I will throw these in the ultrasonic cleaner to clean them up, but only about five minutes. Not too long. I'm gonna 
cut off some cables. Okay, so we're replacing those guys. Save the back piece to measure. Pull everything out of the way. And now I got the derailleurs and the crank exposed so I can easily or easier. So a little side note on these is um, these are a bonded dropout. Back in the day, they were, you know, if anything got compromised, you can, they can rebond these, but yeah, that service is no longer available at Trek. So you gotta be very careful of this alley dropout so it doesn't get compromised. But on the flip side though, literally on this side here will be the serial number and the size of the bike. So this does have a braze on, so there's not a clamp around. It's called a braze-on front derailleur. And it disconnects right here. So these are a little bit easier to deal with. And you don't have weird scarring to the frame. But you can see that the derailleur itself definitely needs some cleaning and loving. And it is a triple, and that's where you'll see this big honking drop of a blade to help that chain to go up those three chain rings. This particular crank has its fixed bolt here and goes through, kind of like your fork. And this is your adjuster side and the locking bolts. So you need to loosen these two guys up here. Their newton meters is four, 12 to 14. to tighten it, which we'll use a Torx wrench to do so when we reassemble. But learning that not putting too much pressure on any bolts, you just want to do a quarter to half a turns on each side until you loosen all the way. In addition to, you want to do that same process when you're tightening so you're not putting too much uneven pressure on all of it. So that's a little gold nugget I learned actually fairly recently. These should have, oh, it's actually missing. There's a little piece in here that would actually be a pin. Um, not necessary to have, technically. Uh, it's nice to have when you're reassembling, but I can definitely do it without. But at some point, that got lost when it was totally disassembled. And uh, I'm getting a little bit of fight here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a little tapping, a little bit of love tap. You can see it's starting to come out a little bit. It's just, just enough to get it to... Apparently it's been on there a while. Uh, oh, come on. <laughs> you know you want to come off. Oh. Whew, there you go. All right, so there's that. We don't want to mess with this magnet because it actually connects there. So when I... Detail the frame, I'll have to be very careful of this little computer mechanism here because I don't want to mess with the calibration of it to the magnets. Also, I'm going to trim these guys down. When you cut these zip ties and you have a little dinger bob sticking out like this at an angle, these are sharp as razor blades. These will cut you good. So I'm going to cut those down um, and actually file them a little bit to prevent any of that razor blade action. And to push this through, oh, just a little palm action. This has a spacer that I just dropped, one that goes inside here. So look how cool those are. Yeah, guess what? Those are not round, they're oval. Now they're kind of following the, the biopace generation here. Um, so yeah, it's kind of supposed to help that dead spot and that circular motion when you're cranking down. Some people love them, some people hate them. So it's a love-hate situation produced in Spain. Look at that, kind of cool. Uh, these will clean up really well um, and get all that gunk off of there to be ready for its new wax chain. Oh, gotta go down and get my part. Also while we're down here, I'm gonna take this cable guide. I specifically made a Torx screwdriver just for this that I hang on the wall because I use it quite often. Uh, this is when we check the bearings and see 
there any kind of compromise. It's really hard to tell. Um, ooh, goodness. Those are kind of chunky. So we may have to replace these guys. Not an expensive lift, but needless to say, it's something you want to replace when you're already here. It's kind of like one of those things that some mechanics will, it's not on the list, I'm not gonna check it off and do it. No, well, for me, if, I, if it's not done right, it's not gonna get done at all. So um, I'll see if I have a set of cups. If not, I'll need to be going down to my local store shop nearby and pick up a set of these. Um, you know, they're around 35 bucks, something like that. So, I mean, the guy's already spending a pretty penny for the premium premium job and he definitely wants the done done right. So, that's what we're gonna do. So while I'm here, so don't forget about it. I take a pair of cutters, flush right to the end of the zip tie where it goes to the catch, get those cut portions out. And then I like to file them down like your fingernails. And if that sounds like fingernails on a chalkboard, I do apologize. But you definitely don't want those sticking out. And I think that might be it for the zip tie land. Some of these computers, I mean, you'll have zip ties all throughout the whole bike. This one's wireless, so it has sensor for the wheel and sensor for the crank to do uh, your uh, revolutions per minute for your crank and the speed and all the other good jazz to go with it. So there we go. Yeah, those are chunky. Nobody likes a chunky BB. So my brakes, same thing. I'll keep track of the cable housing to measure when I do my cutting. But other than that, it's pretty much toast. And these have a bolt on the back, which is a five Allen. These are the works Allens, which are not flat. They have a little scoopy, scoopies to them. It's supposed to help contact and give a better contact to the flat portion of the Allen bolt nut. And uh, these sometimes get wedged in there. So, get a uh, Allen sometimes to uh, pop them out like so. That's a big guy. I also like to make sure they're on there so I don't lose track of which one goes to where. Because on this particular bike, both of these will look very similar, um, but they are different lengths. So. You, uh, same DI, uh, but the length might be a little different, so we want to make sure. Other way to know is most rear caliper brakes on road bikes will be a stubby. Um, that's just inherent of what how these have always been. So they've made this longer to accommodate the thick wallness of the carbon there, so you still have that secure contact without, you know, you have to have enough threads or having that board out to have that little nut that goes up way inside there where it's going to collect a whole bunch of gunk and then you're like picking it out, trying to get out. So this keeps the bolt surface on the outside of the frame, which is nice. So up front, more of the same. You always want to make sure your Allen bolts go in. Sometimes dirt will affect that. And, uh, so here, case in point, it's a longer shaft, but a shorter nut uh, portion to go on top. And also you can tell it has a different uh, flange to the end of it as well. So this is for the front and kind of, can't really save these. I'm not going to anyway, nor would I, but just a heads up, they're a one and done kind of deal for the cable and stops covers. Um, they're not that expensive, relatively. And then we're gonna give this a good cleaning. And this is when we check the brake pad surface area and make sure there's enough material. So you look at the front, it looks like there's pretty decent because there's usually not much wear on the front. And the rear here is a little bit worn down, but not too much. You still see those uh, kind of cuts where those are kind of reliefs that had shed material and so forth. So I'll just, we'll, kind of sand these down, clean it up. 
And when I put these in the ultrasonic cleaner, it'll blow out all that dirt and I'll refresh it with the tri-flow and the pivot points and also these uh, adjuster screws as well as the bolts and preventing rust one second to make it easier for it to be used by the consumer and to adjust in protection. And these need to be popped off. Reason being, I need to get to the frame to do my cleaning, my, my detailing magic. Um, second, it gives me an opportunity to check these bolts to make sure they have not been compromised. Uh, these little guys are, the bolt and nut is riveted into the frame and where that will cause a problem if there's a lot of weight on these and they get compromised. So I always want to double check these, clean them out, and I put lube on the actual bolts when I do return them on there to prevent any kind of contaminants getting in there and causing damage. Also, I'll do a little cleaning on the bottle cages when I'm done. So it also gives me a flatter surface to do detailing. So on this, I just take these. I'll be saving them. Um, double check the length, of course, but we get some new ones cut. And, and on these shifters, when they get older, they have kind of like a, a sticky delay. What happens is there's grease inside from the manufacturer and that hardens over time. And you got to say these are like, you know, 15 years plus. So that's where it's going to get gunked up in there. And so that's where the ultrasonic cleaner does its magic. It gets in there with the heating liquid. It really sheds all that gunk out of the inside of there. And when I replenish it with the Triflo Superior Lube, it's going to shift a lot more smooth and uh, more responsive, more quick, not so hesitating <laughs> kind of thing. So we'll need to strip the tape off and pop these off. I want to bring a point, he had a double wrap underneath here for extra padding. I probably want to contact him to see if he wants me to keep that on there. Because he may find himself underneath here quite a bit. Now it's been done deliberately. Sometimes I do it the whole path. I, you know, they do have gels that can be inserted here. Uh, but at some point he wants to have that extra because you're putting more weight on this portion when you're leaning down. So he may want to keep that. So we will not take that away from him, but we will definitely make sure it's all cleaned up, good to go. Also, this tape is really sticky, so I have to give a good tug to break that connection so it won't peel off and tear as easy when I take it off. But last but not least, I want to pull these cable guides or cable stops off. This gives me an opportunity to clean underneath here. Also clean all the gunk out of them and also refresh the lube so they actually work a little bit better. Uh, you want a lot of these times to get all boogered up with gunk or they don't work very well because they've not been lubed. And it's almost pretty much an eyesore if you can't use it. You want to be able to twist it. The reason being is when you're riding, if your shifting is off just a little bit, you want to have the customer have an opportunity or the rider have the ability to reach down and do a quarter turn to kind of snug up that cable if it's loose or tighten it down to relax it if need be. So it's one of those things, quarter turns only on any barrel adjusters when you do an adjustment, then you kind of hopefully get that derailleur in line or the brakes tightened up where you need them to be. All right, we're at the time, the point of cooking some parts. And he used the ultrasonic cleaner. It gets up to the temperature around about 50 Celsius. Um, that gets it warm enough that it actually the heating element will help clean all this caked on gunk off. If I need to concentrate it with, uh, with cassettes and chains only, I'll put it in a separate little Ziploc baggie and fill it up with simple green straight. The tank has one part simple green, 
the th six to seven part water, but if I need a high concentrated cleaning on a cassette to get all this gunk off, I do keep it in um, the baggie separate and that helps it really cut away. And I've had comments like, does ultras this prohibit the ultrasonic to work? Plastic bags and glass jars, the sound waves go through and doesn't compromise, or if it does, it's very minimal. That's what I found, it does really clean. And the benefit of concentrating it without contaminating your whole tank is uh, pretty much more of a, a happy medium, um, a happy place in between both worlds. So whatever may be compromised with the plastic or the glass jar, which what I've seen so far really hasn't been a compromise, but if it is, it's very minimal. And on this particular one with a tune-up, I will be expanding the, um, the jockey pulleys apart and cleaning those to get good contact and do an extra little pre-scrub of the parts before I put in an ultrasonic cleaner to try to get all this gunk off here. I mean, you don't want the ultrasonic cleaner. I mean, if you could do it quickly beforehand to get a lot of that stuff off, that really aids the sonic cleaner cleaning process to help get you those parts sparkly clean. And that's where you want the you know, this magic to cut to the actual uh, metal areas where it explodes and it blows out all that old gunk. In addition, while that's cooking, I'm going to be cleaning and truing the wheels and prepping them with a ceramic slam and also the frame itself. That's when I do the cleaning and getting the detailing of the frame. And when i going through drying the parts, I do ceramic coating and do a couple stacks, which I need to wait like five to 10 minutes between each stack for those to actually adhere to get, build up that best as possible benefit. Um, in that case, the wheels detailing and the frame detailing, I'm gonna split in two different videos, so you'll see those linked below. I will release those before this video. Uh, the wheels themselves. Um, there's other videos I've done detailing as well on those. And you can see how I do the cleaning, the inspecting, and the uh, ceramic coating on those, as well as the frame. I have a plethora of videos there. Also, I want to take this hot minute to say, hey, if you made it this far in the video, thank you for being a part of the community of Vanilla Guy Bicycles. I appreciate you watching my content. And if you're liking and all that other good stuff, even kudos to you. Thank you for hanging out. Sidebar, okay, done. Let's dive into this and start cooking some parts. All right, there we have the parts all cleaned. Yeah, I came across the issue with the shifter, um, the rear shifter, a 10 speed. It did not want to go back to its original, original position. Usually with the ultrasonic cleaner and the heat and flushing it out with hot water would really enable that to gauge through. I couldn't get it to, it must have had some really gunk up and debris still stuck in there, so I flushed it out again. It did a little bit better, but I had it 
engage it by tapping it to finally come loose. Then, then when I finally went to its original relaxed position, which is the smallest cog, I threw a cable in there so I can actually kind of massage it to go through each one of the gears. And I was just doing one at a time, up and down, then, then four, and then back down. It seems to be working great now. I'll double check it and inspect it once it's installed. But now it's hitting all the gears. See these shifters, they get gunked up inside sometimes and it takes several different flushings and a little bit of tips and tricks to try to get it to come back to life. It was not engaging completely well um, at the beginning, but you know, a lot of hesitation. Yeah, I'm at the top end, right? So we'll count two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, we're doing the whole range on this one. The front shifter, after flushing it in the hot water, you had that, you know, double up and releasing it going down quite easily. So now it's not, okay. <laughs> I haven't lubed this one yet, so it's probably gonna need a little bit of the tri-flow love um, and add a new cable to it as well. So you lube the inside casing here and don't forget there's like an exposed area here where some grit and grime can get in. I like the foam because it kind of really penetrates, well it doesn't kind of, it really does, penetrates inside the shifter and it gets into those all those parts. So once you get into the relaxed position, put that cable in there, obviously wipe off all the little excess grease and uh, and you can see how nice and clean it is now. That way, it'll come back to life. I believe the shifters are gonna be fine once they're all strung up and everything. So that's the only hang up really with the shifters and that's kind of an expensive hang up because when you're looking for a used set of 10 speeds, for Altegra, you're looking at 150 to 200 bucks used. Um, new replacements, well, you'll have to do like a Sora or a Tagra, which is not the greatest thing to do for new because that's all they provide for 10 speed. So there lies, you want to fix these up as good as possible. Uh, usually they do come back to life and they didn't have any scarring. So I knew it was just caked up gunk over a period of time. And once that gets flushed out a couple times with that superior lube, it will be good from, from tri-flow. The bottom bracket bearings, though, yeah, I'm going to have to go to the store, go get me some bearings, and uh, make sure those are good. And while I'm going to add it, I'm going to double-check the headset. The headset feels a lot better, a little smooth. But the bottom bracket, I'm definitely going to have to address when I'm adding these parts back on it. So right now, I'm at the stage where, you guessed it, cleaning the frame getting that prepped and the detailing. So I'll get as far as I can on this today and tomorrow's little errands are gonna be an extra little errand to the bike shop. Get myself some bearings to go inside that and I'll double check everything else, make sure there's nothing else that's sneaky that I need to worry about. And again, these are the situations you come across to, you know, fix her up. And as a mechanic, I try to keep ahead of that. Well, in a situation like this, yeah, 24 hour service, it really rushes this and that mechanic has gone, you need new shifters and a bottom bracket, period. Because they're not gonna do the due diligence of trying to get that to work by flushing as possible. So um, mechanic beware out there per se. They're all not that way, but the higher volume shops or the shops that are more commercial, uh, the T and the S and, and the M, Oh, that's kind of weird. Anyway, um, <laughs> gotta watch out for them. You can find yourself a local bike shop that has local mechanics like me that are around all the time, or just a mechanic that's just this on its own. You might be able to find yourself a little more favorite of kind of service work to your bike, TLC and love, because that's the kind of mechanics gonna, um, if I can't get it done, I'm gonna make sure it's done right, or I'm not gonna do it at all. That's the kind of situation. So here we are, um, well, I'm gonna to have to do some extra work here, but double check the extra results after this. But before you go, all the details of what I've used and so forth are in the description below. If you have any other tips and tricks or you know mechanic advice, I, I, yeah. If you have any other mechanic advice or experiences, please fill in the comments below. It's community here. Please share. In any case, have a wonderful day in your neighborhood. If it's nice in your neighborhood. Get up on the air and go. But before you go, check out these beautiful pictures of the bike.